It's a real pleasure for me to be able to introduce Dr. Haikal. Uh, and if I took all the time uh, that was necessary to do justice to her uh, academic accomplishments, we wouldn't leave enough time for her to lecture, and she has a lot she wants to say, so I'll be very brief. Uh, just to let you know, she's a professor at the uh, American University in Cairo uh, and a visiting professor at uh, La Sorbonne, Le, my French is bad, La Sorbonne, and uh, also at uh, University of Rome La Sapienza. Am I saying this correct? Yes. Correctly. Uh, on the, uh, the, I don't know the exact title for it, but Board of uh, Governors for the uh, Egyptian Collection of the Cairo Museum in, uh, in Cairo. Uh, the greatest collection of Egyptian antiquities uh, in the world, uh, and is internationally acclaimed and known as a scholar, uh, has served as the president of the International Association of Egyptologists. She studied at the University of Cairo, and, and then uh, her PhD was at Oxford under Professor Cherney, one of the great, uh, uh, historically one of the great scholars of Egyptology. Uh, and has written prolifically and wonderful things to read, but rather than regaling you with what she's done in the past, uh, we'll let her tell you what she's doing right now. I'll just add one final note that after uh, having spent uh, the morning uh, with Dr. Haikal, she is a delightful person with a, a wonderful sense of humor and, and a quick understanding, and so I, I look forward to her remarks. Dr. Haikal. Thank you very much for this introduction. Uh, and I thank you for having me here. I'm very pleased to be with all, you all. Uh, I shall try to translate what I wrote as well as I can and as uh, summarize it as much as I can because it's very long. Uh, the title of my lecture is uh, Egyptian Spirituality, Ancient and Modern. And uh, the whole idea uh, is that I'm working on uh, transmission of culture, and I consider that uh, I, I'm working uh, in this paper is transmission of culture in Egypt itself. I've worked on transmission of Egyptian culture outside Egypt, but this is another issue. So uh, transmission of culture exists everywhere. You probably notice as, as I go that there are things which are similar in your own culture. Uh, but the advantage of Egypt uh, and uh, is the, the longevity of its culture. You know that the Egyptian culture, the documented Egyptian culture is older than 7,000 years. So the, before that it was prehistory. And uh, uh, therefore it's uh, almost unequal and it's a, it's a very good field for this uh, studying of continuity. Uh, and the, the, uh, the project I'm working on includes continuity in many fields, but what I'm going to talk about tonight is only in spirituality and not all kind of space, very specific kind of spirituality, which has the uh, veneration of saints in Egypt, ancient and modern. The image you have here is the image of uh, a person from ancient Egypt who lived in the third millennium before Christ. His name is Zoser, and he is the guy who built the first stone pyramid of Egypt uh, in Saqqara. Uh, this man was such a genius that he, his memory survived uh, and he became divinized. So this is actually the, the purpose of, of the paper, to see why, who is divinized, why are people divinized, why do we need an interset, intercession, intercessor between the humans and the divine. Uh, this is what I want to see, if, uh, how it works and how it seems almost indispensable, because in the history of Egypt, after the ancient Egyptian religion, uh, we had uh, many other uh, uh, all, uh, and, uh, ancient religions, but essentially there was some Judaism, Christianity. It, at one point, uh, the majority of Egyptians, if not all of them, were Christians. And then today, the majority, if not all of them, are Muslims. And uh, in uh, Orthodox Christianity, which is the Orthodox Christians of uh, the Copts of Egypt, uh, in the very beginning, there was no such things as the, what I'm going to tell you about now. And then the uh, saints' worship and veneration it was very important, of course, in Orthodox uh, 
uh, church. And then, although it is not at all a tradition in Islamic religion to have saints, we don't have saints. We have, I would say, almost the equivalent of saints. And this is what we are going to, uh, to see. And why is it necessary for people, in spite of the fact that it is not the dogma of the religion, why is it necessary to have it? So we know, firstly, I would like to, to situate you in the Egyptian uh, background. The ancient Egyptians, as you probably know, were very, very religious-oriented people uh, because of the environment in which they lived and in where everything was cyclic. cyclical. You have the cycle of the sun rising every day very regularly. You have the cycle of the flood, the Nile flooding annually very regularly, and the cycle of vegetation which follows the flood of the Nile very regularly. So Egyptians thought that why not the cycle of human life as well. But I expect that these are things which you already know, so I will not expand on that. However, uh, we also have in Egypt, and I'm very proud of uh, mentioning that since I am Egyptian myself, that uh, we have among the oldest uh, books, not among the, but the oldest books in the world, uh, mentioning uh, life after death, mentioning uh, the judgment of the soul after death, that is to say that you do not attain immortality if you are not worth it, and also the criteria and the norms of proper life in, uh, in, uh, in this world, like being uh, virtuous and, and being fair and upholding truth and helping the poor, etc., and no calumny to anybody Etc. This expression of piety is expressed in ancient Egypt to such an extent that they even use a kind of terminology that we find back in Arabic afterwards. It has been translated in Arabic when the country stopped speaking ancient Egyptian and spoke Arabic. For example, they mention the way, the road of life, the right road, you know, the right way, the straight way, the way that leads you to God. <coughs> All these expressions which exist in ancient Egypt, like what an ankh or metan an khan ankh, are the exact counterpart of what we know of today in, uh, in Arabic when we pronounce, we, we use the same expressions in the different language. Now, how did this concept of sanctity develop? Who are the saints? In ancient Egypt, uh, the, li the, the, con the vision of the world uh, is, uh, I would say, quite clear because it is the same for me. It is very clear because this is the, the vision that we hold today. Some people in Europe maybe do not or in the West in general, but in the East it's very common. And it, uh, it is that uh, Egyptian thing that uh, life and death are interconnected. There is interdependency between the living and the death that the dead and the, and, and the divine is all around us. It's not located somewhere else. It's around us. And therefore, the connection is very clear. It is our perception which is too weak. We cannot see them, but they can see us. Uh, and so that every time somebody dies, he passes, his soul passes on to the other line around us. And all the dead are divinized by means of the rituals that are performed on them mummification, embalming, opening of the mouth ceremonies, etc. And they are all divinized. However, some are better than others. The hierarchy exists everywhere. So the people who were useful uh, during their lifetime and who were uh, not only good people, because there are many good people who did not do much good to the others except uh, to, to, to the community at large, they were very limited. Uh, the, the, those who did good things like, for example, great architect, great philosopher, great doctors, great uh, etc., anything which is a little bit larger, uh, great civil servants, very important, all these people were, uh, had a higher status and they were venerated, uh, the, they were granted by the king, by Pharaoh, a right to become sanctified in a way in as much as they could have, uh, they present, pres uh, offerings were presented to them, statues were presented to them, more than to the regular dead, 
and uh, a lot of uh, votive offerings were presented to them. And this uh, sanctification lasted more or less long. Some people were longer than others. And uh, can I have a... Uh... Yeah, this is the chapel, which is called the Hutka, that they have. And you can see at, at the end, the statue, the head of the statue. This is a man called Hekaib from the Middle Kingdom. And his cult lasted for the whole Middle Kingdom, that is to say about uh, uh, the um, end of the first intermediate period and the Middle Kingdom, 11th and 12th and even 13th dynasty. Although he died in the 6th dynasty, but we have evidence of the cult and the chapel, etc., a little bit later. Now we have a number of saints like that, and we recognize them in ancient Egypt uh, by the fact that they received for a long time in their life a cult, and some of them uh, became gods in the Greek and uh, Roman period. Can we have it? Uh, uh, I don't know where it is. Yeah, okay. So I, every time I do that, you, you do one. Okay? So uh, I'm just showing you one more. Uh, this is his chapel, one more. And this is another one called Amenhotep, Amen, uh, son of Hapu, from the New Kingdom, who also was very native. And these people were so, they were divinized. One under the name of Asclepius, because he became identified with a Greek god, and the other one kept his name, but they were very, very important. They had, they performed miracles. They, they were doctors, medical doctors, and they, um, they cured people, uh, and they were worshipped in places like uh, Dir al-Bahari. This is uh, Petosiris of the late period. And uh, this man also was very important because of the purpose we are talking about here, uh, that he is getting closer and closer in his philosophy and his worship to a kind of monotheism. So uh, the, the ancient Egyptian spirit, spirituality, starting from the cult of the dead, developed into the cult of the better dead, the saints. And from the better dead, they uh, developed into the cult of the gods, of course. So which existed there, but even the cult of the gods gradually developed to such an extent that they were syncretized and they reached a kind of uh, uh, monotheism. Now, uh, there are many, many more of these, and so I am not going to uh, mention them all because uh, we want to pass on to something more important. Uh, these, uh, there are many words to express uh, a saint or uh, an important person, uh, you can, uh, so uh, among the things which make you recognize them in ancient Egypt is when uh, somebody says, I am beloved of, and then a regular name, not a god. Because the theophoric names are common in Egypt. For example, like you'd say in, uh, in English, uh, um, Theodorus, for example, which is, means the, given by God. Uh, so there is the word God in it. There are very many names which have names of divinities, Amen, Amhat, Hotmus, etc., Ramses, all these are Theophilus names. So whenever the, the, a human being is, the name of a human being is replacing the name of a God that we know, we assume that this guy must have had a high status and probably revered as a God. Moreover, these people were uh, associated with other divinities. When they had, uh, when they had uh, sanctuaries, they were associated with other divinities. And uh, they, were, uh, they, may, they, were, they had links with them as if they were the son of the, the sun god Tah, for example, the, the, the god Tah or the sun or Amon, etc. In order to raise their uh, relationship, and, and, and uh, underscore their sanctity by bringing them closer to the great deities of Egypt. We have something similar today, that is to say 7,000 years later or 5,000 years later. Later, we still in Egypt in the funerary ritual have a few things which are similar to the cult of the ancient Egyptian ancestors. For example, this is a modern tomb in, in, in the desert of Egypt, uh, of, of Cairo, in the cemetery of Cairo. And uh, today, uh, we still, uh, this, uh, this is also a tomb. You see, it looks like a house, like the houses of ancient Egypt. And we still have this idea of presenting offerings to the dead, making libation to the dead, 
in order for his soul to revive. Uh, we, we still do that, but we do not, no longer, whether Christian or Muslim, do it with the idea of presenting it to the dead, but they present it on behalf of the dead so that, uh, you see, this is a modern, uh, sorry, it's okay. This is a modern, uh, uh, very popular modern. I showed you the, the, the great tombs uh, before. And then you have here a cenotaph with the cupola, which belongs to a person which is considered a little like a saint of ancient Egypt. We call these a sheikh, and we'll come back to that later on. Now people go visit their dead, next please, and they buy flowers, you will see, they get, you see, they have on their, uh, carrying on their head, food offering, but they don't present it to the dead, they present it on behalf of the dead, as charity to the poor people who are all over the cemeteries, and uh, they uh, do, you see, they buy flowers, etc., and they will recite prayers from the Quran or from the Bible, uh, according to their denomination, and they do that on behalf of the dead so that God forgives his sins. So it's not for him to survive, because we, of course, know that he doesn't need that, but uh, for him to be uh, 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 as a charity on behalf of his sins. Now, while I was working on this, among the titles which are famous in ancient Egypt is the title Eat Neche, Father of the God. And one of the, our colleagues, who is particularly specialized in Christian archaeology, uh, mentioned that uh, there is in Coptic the, 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 the title Yot, which means father, uh, and uh, is a very common title applied to priests, in, uh, priests and also saints of the Coptic uh, church. In the, so he was wondering whether these uh, fathers of the church, called the, the father, the yacht of the church, the idea is not the same that we had in ancient Egypt about the fathers, the Iknecher, and for people who are uh, in the field of Egyptology, the man who did that is called Fr uh, Christian Canuet. He's Belgium and he works in Coptic, uh, essentially. So he thought that there are in ancient Egypt, spiritual fathers. And that the spirituality, the spiritual fathers are sometimes not always known. We do not know all the names that were given to them. But he makes the analogy, since Coptic comes immediately after Pharaonic, uh, he uh, made uh, the analogy and said there is probably uh, schools of spirituality, and the spiritual fathers are there to guide people. And indeed, until today, in Coptic, whenever I meet a father, uh, a, a Christian priest, I call him my father. And uh, it's a sign of respect. There are other words also, which are in ancient Egyptian and, and which sound the same as the words that we use in modern Egypt. There, are there is a terminology of people which is called, a group of people called the Hesiu, meaning the blessed ones. And we have in Arabic, something, the same thing, which is also the blessed ones. And there is the Hariu, those who are above. And the analogies have been done by many people, among them Quigelberg and other people who are very famous. And there are, uh, we have, uh, uh, there are words like Hui, protector, and we have also in Arabic the same thing. And all these terminological words are translated almost verbatim. Hasiu Mabruk or Mubarak. Hariu Sayyidi, which is the same thing that we use in Arabic. So uh, what I am trying to, to underline here is the idea that uh, the language, there is a transmission in the language, a translation of the idea from ancient Egyptian into Arabic. So the, the word, the same word is used. Can I have more of these, please? Uh, this is the man who recites the Quran at the, at the head of the tomb. Like in ancient Egypt, the Kheri Hab was reciting uh, lectures. He was reading lectures. This is more of the same, the, the, the tombs, the tombs of an, an important person and the tomb of less important people who are gathering around him. Like they're gathered around the saints in ancient time. They presented votive statues and votive offerings, and they wanted to be uh, buried near him. Here, it is the same thing. If there is somebody who is 
considered as a saint or a, or a wise man. People like to be buried around him, etc. Uh, next, please. While they eat, there is a kind of communion. They eat of the offering that they're bringing. You see the people eating down there near the tomb because eating in the cemetery out of the things that you are presenting to the deceased is as if you were communing with, uh, commuting, uh, communing with him and you are drinking and remembering him and eating and remembering him and he, and he is in your presence and distributing the food to the poor. Next, please. Uh, these are uh, ceremonies of uh, festivals. We are coming now to that. I want, before I, I come to that immediately, I want to tell you that all these saints in Egypt, ancient Egypt and Coptic Egypt and Islamic Egypt, uh, whatever their name may be, the very fact that they are sanctified give them a kind of power of blessing, baraka, that emanates from them. In Arabic, it is called baraka, and people who have gone to, been to Egypt probably know these words. And uh, in ancient Egypt, for example, and I've seen it done uh, in Catholic Christianity, I don't know if it's done everywhere, and I've seen it done, of course, in Orthodox Egypt, uh, this blessing that the, 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 the deceased emanates from, from him makes that he has relics, the saints, the martyrs have relics, and the relics carry the same blessing that emanate from the deceased. Anything that belongs to them has it. And because anything that belongs to them has it, their clothes, their tombs, their uh, cenotaphs, their statues, everything like that, the, peop the, the, the living can get the blessing by praying to these, by touching these, if they touch a statue or if they touch a covering of, of the, the tomb or something, they get the blessing of the deceased. And they communicate with the deceased. Like in ancient Egypt, they can offer him, like they wrote letter to the deceased in ancient Egypt, they wrote letter to the deceased asking him to interfere in their life, to tell them who has cheated them, to tell them who has robbed them, to tell them what to do and not what not to do in certain things, to beg them to intercede for them uh, near the, the greater gods in order to get to have a better life, better health, etc. The same thing continues and it's done with the saints of Christianity and the saints of modern Egypt. And all this can be done essentially through direct contact, and the direct contact is by going and visiting the saint, or by having festival for this saint. And the festival, these are festival of the god Sokaris in ancient Egypt. The god Sokar of ancient Egypt is a god of the dead with potential life. He is the facet, the facet of Osiris, Amon in the underworld, through which the god has to pass when the sun sets, he has in order to rise again, to be insufflated with life again, and to go into, into the body of Sokar Osiris and to get from him the potentiality of life and rise again. So this cycle, which is celebrated during the festival, the festival is the, the, the proof that the, 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 the ritual has been performed on the dead, that they have spent the night praying for him, the night of the sun and uh, of the sun praying for him, for the, the, the deceased also, they called it the watchers of the visuals at night. And at the, as a result of the visuals, look, he comes out in the procession, the deceased has arisen from death, and he comes out the dead in the procession to show that he's well alive. He receives offering to show that it is to be reinvigorated, and all these things happen in all three religions. So, uh, uh, Carrie, can you please move on? Well, one more, please. Well, you see, now this is a Christian uh, uh, celebration of uh, Mary Gerges. Mary Gerges is St. George. And uh, now I explain to you what the saints of ancient Egypt were and how they have this emanation of, of uh, baraka, of blessings out of them. The same thing happens with the martyrs, the martyrs of the church who were martyrized because they were Christians and they, they did not want 
to abandon their faith, and they were martyrized essentially under the Romans. And these people now, as martyrs, have replaced in the, in the, in the subconscious of the Egyptian the martyrs of or the saints of ancient Egypt, who they, they were not martyrs, but they were sanctified. And these people, like the ancient Egyptian god or, or, uh, or uh, saint, had a festival and went out in the festival, and people saw him in the festival, presented him letters and votive offerings. Uh, that instead of doing it now for the ancient Egyptians, they do it for the Christian. Can you have more? So you see, you have, these are uh, Orthodox uh, church, and you see the icon, these are, all these are coming from St. George, but you'll see more later. More, please. More, please. This is the procession, you see. And then what I find very interesting in the details of the procession, this is the church, and the procession is done inside the church. They, in Christianity now, they write their letters and put them in the icons, in the frames of the icons, in the walls of the church, or anywhere they can in order to reach for, their, for what they want to reach the, the, uh, the saint. Interesting also enough, in Egypt, uh, the saints are specialized. Some are medical people more than others. Some are for women more than for men. Some are, uh, can cure people. I'm talking about Christian, uh, Christianity now. Uh, during their lifetime, uh, uh, for example, the, the Pope, uh, Chirolo VI, for people who have some knowledge of Coptic history, uh, was very famous. He used to cure people. When a person would enter uh, to, his, uh, to, to his office, wherever he was, he could immediately see him and, uh, and tell him, you have this disease and Jesus Christ will uh, cure you. Uh, interesting things that I want to show you here, the transmission. I'm afraid I'm going a bit fast because uh, of time. Uh, when I studied this, uh, you know, in ancient Egypt, the ritual is done in such a way, whenever you are, the priests are worshiping the god, they enter the temple. There are di different steps to reach the, 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 the altar of the temple, the, the, uh, the sanctuary where the, the statue is. The statue is in a niche, and then the priest who opens the doors of the niche is opening the doors of heaven. Because he's going to see the God, the God is supposed to be in heaven. So by opening the doors, it is called when are we pet opening the doors of heaven. He who opens the doors of heaven. Now, if you go to a Coptic church, like here, it's written on the iconostas. You notice the iconostas? No? The, in a Coptic church, and this is specific to Coptic church, you do not see the altar. It is behind a wall which has all the icons of the saints on it, the, the Virgin Mary and Jesus Christ and the saint to whom the, the church is, uh, is uh, presented. And then when the service is done, they open the central door. There are three. There is a central chapel and two small chapel. They open the doors, like, and then... These doors, behind the doors, is the altar, and therefore the communion is done there, and the, all the recitation of the liturgy is done there, so it is supposed to be heaven. So they open the door of heaven. It is written on the Coptic church, opening the door of heaven. So I thought that was a very, very typical example of transmission of culture in Egypt. Here you have sometimes the, the children who are going to be baptized in the, in the, not those, those are little, uh, little shemmesi, little, like the choir and, and little boys who work in the church, but sometimes the people are going to be baptized, they are wearing uh, um, crowns, like, like the crowns and the, that the ancient Egyptian wore after they were justified, they were vindicated in the tribunal of the officer words. That is to say, when they were given the new birth, they were entitled, accredited, as being here Christians, because they are baptized, and there they were given the new life. So this crown, which in ancient Egypt is called crown of justification, sometime is worn in, ancient, in the Christian church. The interesting thing about it is the transmission is unconscious. People who do it, they don't know, unless they are Egyptologists and they have been doing the study like me, they don't know 
that this has been transmitted. And there are many, many other things like that. Next, please. Now, after the one, one of the, so there are three important moments in these processions, which you will see in ancient Egypt, which you will see in Christianity, and which you will see in Islam. The important moments are the watches, the prayers. People pray, and usually they pray all night. In Christianity, they pray, and then at the end, they recite the liturgy and the, for, for, the, for the saint. In Islam, they pray for whoever they considered as a saint. I am going to use this word, although we don't have saints in Islam. We have walis or sheikh, and uh, which are good people, but sanctification is not that easy. Uh, and uh, then uh, people pray for them, but they pray for, not for, they, they don't pray them, but they pray for them. They pray God for them. And uh, so it's usually done also, can be done by day, but also by night. So you see the three religions are concentrating their religions by night. And then afterwards, there is what we call the ziyara, that is to say the visit to the cenotaph or to the icon or to the tomb, tomb of the, the, the ancient Egyptian icon or tomb or reliquaries of the Christian uh, martyr or to the tomb or cenotaph of the Muslim. And then you present the offering and letters, etc. And if you make a vow and uh, say, if uh, I have somebody who is sick and somebody is cured, this somebody is cured, and you have promised that you are going to give some, something to, to, the, to the saint or the sheikh, then you present him with an offering. And then at the end, there is very often this offering is a sacrifice of an animal. We have sacrifice of animals in ancient Egypt. We have sacrifice of animals in modern Egypt and Christian or Muslim. And you can see here that this blood, which is uh, the blood of the sacred animal, sacred because it has been offered to a saint, has a protective value. This is why the people are putting it on their babies and on their hands and on their houses, because it is a, a blood of an animal which has been dedicated to the saint or to the divinity, like in ancient Egypt, and therefore it has received the blessing and it gives the blessing. Okay, next please. But next to this, there is a big fair and people are enjoying themselves. This is a Christian uh, ceremony and you have also the Muslim ceremonies which do almost the same thing. Can we go a bit faster please uh, with this because the time is running. I want you to, to see, yeah, this, you see, is a Muslim festival with all this illumination. And here it's written just before, Ya Nur al-Nabi, meaning the light of the Prophet. So what I want to say that it is the, 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 the saint here, which has the equivalent name as in ancient Egypt and Coptic, here is a little bit less important than in Christianity because it all relates at the end of the day to the prophet and to God and to the light of the prophet and to God. So, and uh, the people are doing all the ceremonies and all the religious part of it, but next to the religious part, there is the fun part, the trade part, the social part where people are commuting and meeting them each other. And this we have again in ancient Egypt, in Christian Egypt and in modern Egypt. There is one thing, and this is the, I'm going to end with this. I'm going a bit fast. Uh, there is also organization of devotion. For example, uh, you, can, you can make devotion, you can make your prayers individually. You can pray individually, but you can also pray in group from ancient Egypt, in Coptic time, and in Islamic time. And it has, we, uh, people have discovered in ancient Egypt that there are already schools or confreries or how, how shall I call it? Uh, do you say confreries? Brotherhood. Brotherhood and sisterhood. In, in a, but uh, it's usually brotherhood, including women as well, uh, of people who are worshiping the same, uh, the same divinity or the same saint 
who are faithful to a particular one. They, they, they worship them all, but they're more faithful. They are concentrated more on one than on the other. So these people who are faithful to one have, it's very interesting because the, 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 the administrative organization is similar in ancient Egypt there is a pre, there is a high, uh, the, the head of the, the, the brotherhood, there is the assistant of the brotherhood, there are the laws of the brotherhood, and among the laws of the brotherhood is solidarity, social solidarity, that people should stand for each other whenever it's needed, etc. And we have this in ancient Egypt, we have this in Christianity, a little bit less because the church is doing most of the, the job, and then we have it again in Islam. So it's very interesting to see how it in a way continued throughout the history of Egypt with slight alteration, of course, the alteration come because of the alteration of the, the difference of religion and the development of the spirituality which adds on to what exists, but at the basis, the bases are the same. They need the same intercession between a, a normal person and God. It's a kind of humility maybe which makes people not direct themselves directly to God, although in most religion that I know, God is here, God is present. God tells you in all the books, I am here, call me, and you don't need an intercessor. However, in spite of that, the intercessor is created by the people, not by the religion. So uh, it, if, if you look at all the details, you will see how much you can see the similarities which exist between ancient and modern Egypt. In the, the terminology, which has been translated from ancient Egypt to modern Egypt, in the spirit and in even the ritual, uh, even the prayers, even the, the way they are doing their prayers. And there is a very interesting uh, quotation that I want to finish on, uh, and then I shall pass on a few more of these slides, uh, uh, which is made by Philippe Dershan, and I am going to translate it to you. Uh, he says that uh, the dimension of uh, religion across time is very important because the people who believe adapt it to their new environment, new circumstances, etc. And by believing and adapting their belief, they influence what they believe. So there is the religion varies, develops even if the dogma does not develop, but the practice of the religion develops across the ages according to the needs and to the conception of the people who use it. And thank you very much. I hope I conveyed briefly what I want to say because I have here too many things to, to mention. Okay, so I just want to, you to, to run this so it gives you an idea of the festivities, you know. Uh, uh, and it's okay, go but not too fast, huh? so that I can make some comment on them. These are the, the, the festivities, boy and babies and children are playing and having ha particular hats, particular suites according to the saints they go to. And what I want to say is the, also interesting because sometimes you see in Christianity, uh, the saints of Christians or the, the Mashaykh of Islam, I told you were uh, a little bit sometimes specialized in particular cases of, uh, of uh, uh, to cure particular diseases, etc. So you can find Christians or Muslims going to a saint of the other people. So you can find Christian and Muslims going to the same saint, whether he's Christian or Muslim. You see what I mean? Because for them, it doesn't matter. For them, it is the spirituality that the, the the, 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 the saint has that they require. It doesn't matter whether he's a Christian or Muslim because spirituality is spirituality. And I think this is very beautiful and I like that very much. Uh, also, uh, I have, if you can uh, pass on, I want to show you they have banners and, and, and colors, etc., because they have different philosophical schools, but they all add, they are all aiming to the same thing a better knowledge of God, a better wisdom and more love, so that all the nominations are doing the same thing. So this is what also is interesting in the spirituality. From ancient Egypt till today, the, whole, the aim is always the same. Next, please. You see, this is a man who is welcoming, you know, for example, in a festival. The people who, uh, who are 
having the festival, whether the church or the, the brotherhood, are feeding anybody as the guest of the saint. Like the, it's, it's like a pilgrimage. They come to this man or to, to, to these festivities, and the organizers of the festivities are treating all equally. All are fed to the extent that you have very rich and very poor people all together. And people who are sponsoring and people who are coming just because they, it's a way of getting fed and, cl and, and closed. Next, please. Uh, next. Well, you see the crowds that, uh, that you have. Next, please. One more. Well, here, for example, there are also uh, negative aspects to these festivals. Sometimes there are illicit things which are performed because there are so much crowds. And uh, uh, they have been condemned very often by ancient, uh, by, uh, from, from Coptic period till today, they have been condemned a lot, considering that they were doing wrong things, that there were too much uh, uh, inter interaction between sexes, etc., and that some people were taking advantage of it. So it has been condemned. However, in spite of the condemnation of the government, etc., things continue, which means that it is a necessity in this country, in this culture. And I think it's not only in Egypt, I think it's in many other countries. Next, please. Well, this is, I just show you the decoration that are, of course, the whole, that are made for the festivities. Next, please. This is for kids. Next. 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 There is one I want to show you. Next. Here you are. You see how this is a tool, and the people come and touch, taking the blessing like you would have a, a cross or whatever, and then you keep on touching it because you are getting the blessing out of it. Like you go to church and, and, and pray. You understand? So this, the blessing comes out. It's like people who kiss the relics. Huh? The relics, sometimes we have relics of saints, are used in ancient Egypt also in order to cure people by uh, passing the relics on the sick body. So it also exists, and so on. Next, please. Uh, here, this is uh, the man who is there is chanting hymns to the glory of God, and sometimes and prayers for the well-being of the saint and the prophet. And all the people who are around him are repeating after him what he says. And, in such a, a, a way that the melody makes them get into an ecstasy, a kind of ecstasy which makes them feel that they are closer to the divine. Uh, next, please. These are the heads of the brotherhood, and they lead the processions. Uh, so there are many important brotherhoods uh, who were interpreters of, uh, of the Quran in Islam, and uh, of course, these people died. They were in the Middle Ages. And the, the confreries were made after their names. And uh, they pass it on from one uh, sheikh, who is the heir, who is uh, the responsible for the well-being of the brother. And the organization is done in such a way so that it passes on. 